We've got one of my favorite people in the community, Jordan Wittenberg, with us today. We're going to be talking about a story that he just recently told me, but I want to dig deeper today about knocking a door and making a hundred plus thousand dollars. And not only that, but also assigning it to somebody that went on to make $50,000 on the, their own. Multiple people made a lot of money on this deal. And I think one of the hardest things that we'll do as men is wondering, should I turn right or should I turn left? And being caught at that stoplight of life of making hard decisions. And Jordan's going to jump into that today in his story about how he made a hundred plus thousand dollars on one stinking deal. Jordan, what's up, brother? How you yeah, doing? what's up, Pace? Excited to tell the story because it's a pretty wild one. I know, I know. And, um, you know, by the way, you just won some state championship or something? I coach high school basketball in Idaho. And when I joined the staff, we were a 500 team last year. And what does that mean? It means we won as many games as we lost. Okay. And so it wasn't like I was joining some perennial powerhouse. Um, so, um, made an incredible run towards the end of the year and just started playing our best basketball in playoffs. Same players. Essentially the same team coming back. They just had, were a year older and better and, uh, figured some things out and how connected they were and just played good basketball at the right time of the season. We ended up beating the number one seed in the state championship game and won the state title. And it was a unbelievable experience. So, wow. Yeah, really happy for the kids too. Wow, dude. Yeah. In a lot of ways, that's cooler than a $100,000 assignment. You know, what's interesting is, have you guys all heard that? By the way, we have a live audience. Guys, give it up. Live audience. <laughs> um, everybody's heard the Mexican fisherman story, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I take three minutes and tell this story? <laughs> yeah. It's one of the best stories of all time. And I'll read it. I'll read it to you because I will, um, I'll make it that concise. Okay. Wow. This is, this is really great. And we'll tie it into your deal. An American investment banker was at the pier of a small coastal Mexican village when a small boat with just one fisherman docked. Inside the small boat were several large yellowfish tuna. The American complimented the Mexican on the quality of his fish and asked how long it took for him to catch them. The Mexican replied, only a little while. The American then asked, why didn't he stay out longer and catch more fish? The Mexican said he had enough to support his family's immediate needs. The American then went and asked, but what do you do with the rest of your time? The Mexican fisherman asked, well, I sleep late. I fish a little. I play with my children. I take siestas with my wife. Oh, that's the best. <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's how right? more, more can come about. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I like that. He says, I sleep late. I fish a little play with my children, take siestas with my wife, Maria. I stroll into the village each evening where I sip wine and I play guitar with my amigos. I have a full and busy life. The American scoffed. <sighs> okay, I'm a Harvard MBA and I could help you. You should spend more time fishing and with the proceeds, buy a bigger boat. With the proceeds from the bigger boat, you could buy several boats. Eventually, you would have a fleet of fishing boats Instead of selling your cats to a middleman, you would sell directly to the processor, eventually opening up your own cannery. You would control the product, processing, and distribution. You would need to leave this small coastal fish, uh, fishing village and move to Mexico City, then LA, and eventually New York City, where you will run your expanding enterprise. The Mexican fisherman asked, but how long will this all take? The American uh, replies, 15, maybe 20 years. And the Hispanic guy says, okay, but what then? Then what do I do if I hit that? The American says, that's the best part. When the time is right, you would announce an IPO and sell your company st uh, stock to the public and become incredibly rich. You would make millions. Mexican fisherman says, millions? Then what? Mm -hmm. The American says, then you would retire. Move to a small coastal fishing village where you would sleep late <laughs> Fish a little, play with your kids, take siestas with your wife, stroll to the evening villages where you would sip wine and play guitar with your amigos. So I, I think about this and, you know, Jordan, something that's impressive and really cool about what you've done with the money, actually, that you earned here, I think is the coolest part about the story. And I can't wait till you get to that point. Yeah. I look at the high school thing, you know, you pouring into these young men and being a coach to them and, and giving them guidance and love and information they didn't have before and turning them and chiseling into stronger men mm -hmm. is probably your your life's calling not making a hundred thousand dollar checks right. 
But ironically, the $100,000 check does alleviate some of the stress and the burden of the everyday life and allows you to live your purpose. And so that's why we chase money to a certain degree. And there's just this really harmonious balance that we're always trying to find, right? Totally. Um, and um, you're definitely on that journey. You're trying to figure that out, which is fun. And I think all of us are trying to figure that out. At the end of the day, do we really want to be rich or do we want to win the champ state championship when you're not on the court, but you're coaching the people who do win the championship and you get to be a, a a big part of that puzzle. That's so cool. Yeah. I mean, the business side kind of enables a little more freedom to do the things that really feel meaningful and impactful. And so, uh, they got to go together, um, because it's, it's tough to make a living on a high school basketball coach salary, but if you can develop other skills and gain other knowledge, um, that can enable you to open doors, uh, for, for business opportunities. And in this case, something that ended up preventing someone from being homeless at a late stage of his life. Seems like your calling is just helping a lot of people, isn't it? I think so. I mean, I think that's what, that's what we're supposed to do. I think it's what makes us feel good. I think our creator reminds us that every time we help somebody, you get that touch of light inside your body and you're like, oh, I want to do this more. And it's just a reminder our creator gives us to a certain degree. Yeah. And I think when it's all said and done, I think our lives will be measured on things like that. Like the difference we made in others' lives. Well, this difference you made in William, your seller's life, yeah. was not an easy one. So let's go through the story. So you you joined about a year ago. You start networking with other people. And you know, you've know you been a real estate agent for a good amount of time, right? Uh, about four years. Okay. And so you already had real estate knowledge. You understood yep. a lot of things. Where was your jumping off point of generating leads and opportunities? Was it foreclosing or doing foreclosure door knocking? Or how did you get to this point where you knocked on William's door? I mean, as an agent, I was just getting referral business and generating my own stuff, traditional ways, open houses and things like that. And then when I got plugged in with sub two and I was learning creative finance and, uh, the, you know, the opportunity in finding distressed sellers, uh, I just kind of got out of my comfort zone and started knocking doors and, um, not something you really want to do, but, uh, and I didn't have a whole lot of a strategy going into it. I was kind of just like, I'm going to figure out what's going on with the situation and figure it out as I go. So your jumping off point and generating off market leads was door knocking foreclosures. Yeah. That's ballsy. Yeah. Um, and, and with your, you know, how you introduced it with my decision to keep knocking, cause I had knocked a few doors that night. Mm. Um, my grandma was just visiting in town and I wanted to go home and visit with her and my kids and, and hang out. And there was one other house left on that ride back that I could have knocked. And I just had a few unsuccessful interactions prior to that. And I ended up just deciding, I think I'm just going to do one more. And, yeah, and that I, ended up being the door. This was my, this was an interesting thing. So you, your wife at the time, I'm kind of letting some of the cat out of the bag. Your wife at the time was working a full-time job. Working full-time remotely as an executive assistant to some C-suite level execs with a healthcare company. Yeah. Okay. So and, she's busy. But with two young kids. You got two uh, young kids and she's pregnant. Did you know she, she was, was pregnant? pregnant at the time? Yeah. Okay. She knew she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. Now I just met your, your baby. Yeah. He was sleeping. Yep. Ace. Ace Jordan. Um, so she's stay at home. Mom has a full-time job executive assistant, which means that she's working Saturdays and Sundays, even she's doing everything she possibly can. So you're basically like, all right, you had a couple of door knocks, they fail. That's not a good feeling. Yeah. Um, you then are at a stoplight, essentially, mm -hmm. and you go left to go home, mm -hmm. you go right to William's house. And there's a justification, I see a lot of men do this. And this is where the delicate balance comes in. The delicate balance comes in where you could have easily argued, I did work today. I did try and knock on doors. Mm -hmm. It's not my fault it wasn't unsuccessful or it wasn't successful. I'm going to turn left today because I've done my duty to my job. I'm now going to do my duty to my wife and help her because I know she expects me. It's my grandma that's visiting. My wife doesn't want to be there by herself with my grandma and the kids and all that kind of stuff, shouldering and juggling. It's not that she's not against it or she's against yeah. it. It's just she would probably appreciate my help. So that's your argument and your, the pull of the gravity to your house is on the left. And then there's the pull of the gravity on your right-hand side, which is William's house is this way. And what have I always said about, what do I say? Anything that sticks in your mind of things I say about door knocking, why it's a good avenue for success. Because mm. nobody wants to do it. Yeah, you're setting yourself apart by doing the, the work people mostly want to avoid. Right. As you put it the other day. Yeah. So you're at the stoplight 
it's red, it's about mm-hmm. to go green, and you're having this pull in your mind of like, do I go home to help my wife? I should help my wife. I'm a good husband. I should help my wife. I'm, I'm not a piece of crap husband. I'm going to go home and help my wife. <laughs> And then you had this pull of, wait, hold on a second. There's a reason why people are successful in door knocking and it's because they don't quit in moments like this. Yeah. And, and when I got there too, there was a wholesaler at his door. Oh, there was, Um, I don't know this part of the story. Yeah. So, so there was, you know, this was just a, a few days prior to an auction. I mean, this thing was coming down to the wire and what these wholesalers kept coming across was that this guy who had been living there for over 40 years. 74 year old man, uh, didn't, he was not the titled owner to the house. He had inherited it from his grandma who had passed away about 30 years earlier Mm. in the early nineties. And she left it to him and as well, maybe I should go back just a bit. You should go back. You skipped over my favorite part of the whole story. Okay. (laughs) We here's the, here's the part you, you skipped over was the great, the first line that William said to you at the door. Right. So that wholesaler leaves. I, I say, okay, now I'm going to So you turn right. Obviously, you turn right at the stoplight. You mm-hmm. go down to William's house. You're yep. sitting in front of the house. You see somebody there. That's also another point where you, if you see somebody... I know, John, you've been on appointments. Who else has been on appointments before where you go to the house and somebody else is already at the house meeting with the seller, right? Boom. And there's a lot of times where you look at that and you go, you know what? My wife needs my help. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go home, take care of the kids. Yeah. Did you have any sort of tug in your I mind? I mean, I was parked on the side of the road and one of the neighbors was actually like kind of suspicious because it's just this guy sitting in his car in front of a house. He's yeah. like, hey, can I help you? Uh, so he thought I was like, you know, some creepy guy just... How do you say that when you're bothered by somebody? He's like, hey, can I help you? <laughs> yeah. Is that how it was? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Said, you said it a gonna... lot nicer than I think he probably said it to you. <laughs> yeah, he had a little tone to it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So this dude, was he had, had he had success getting William to answer the door? Yeah. Um, he, he was just talking to him in the driveway. Um, so William didn't have a car, didn't have a phone, didn't have an email, didn't have any of the stuff you might normally reach out. Um, came to find that, came to find that out. Um, but I was waiting for that wholesaler to leave and then I was just going to go talk to him. So when I go knock his door, um, Oh, this is, there's so many lessons here. Think about this one lesson. Mm -hmm. The wholesaler leaves and most people that are new, you're brand new in this situation, right? Like in a lot of regards, obviously in that you, situation, yeah. you, like you'd never successfully gotten a foreclosure door knocked and right. gotten a deal done at this point. So this is new territory for you. Right. You see another person talking to the guy and you're like, well, he already beat me to the punch. How many freaking times does this happen on a daily basis for somebody that's new in the investment world? Mm-hmm. Oh, competition. I'm, I'm going to back off. And he clearly already had rapport with William because I could overhear their conversation a little bit from my window cracked. You sneaky son of a gun. I just wanted to see what, maybe I could learn something from it. And, and William seemed to really want to do the deal with this guy. I could hear him saying, you're my only hope. You're my only hope. No. He, he thought it was going to auction for sure. And so he was banking on him winning the auction and would hopefully rent it back to him. I see. And the guy just kept saying, I could hear him say, oh, I can't make any promises. And so I could tell he's just trying to get the deal. And he really didn't have Williams. I didn't feel like he had his best interest. He must so. have been a real estate agent. <laughs> <laughs> Strong sorry. potential. Sorry, sure. sorry, sorry. <laughs> so I go to knock the door. And, and I remember you asked me, What's, what was your first line to him? Yeah. And he had the first line. I, before I could even say anything, he said, don't waste your time. It's hopeless. Basically just shutting the door. For How me. many things, like the universe is like testing Jordan, the situation like, okay, you're at the stoplight. Your wife needs your help. Should And it's late. You've already failed at door knocking. You should probably just go home. He turns right, pulls up, sees a wholesaler in the driveway, having some rapport. Oh, could easily go away. Or somebody comes up and knocks on your door. Can I help you? Yeah. Like all these little things. And then on top of it, Will, uh, William says, you, what does he say again? Just just don't waste your time. It's hopeless. Don't waste your time. It's hopeless. It's like, all right, the universe is like, I'm going to test you, Jordan. Yeah. And so my response to him was, I'm here to solve problems. Mm. And he said, okay, come in. And so I sat down in his living room. He explains the whole situation for about an hour. And he can talk. And so he was, it was on and on. And it's like a hoarder house, you know? And so... He's showing me the will that his grandma wrote and his name is, is in it. 
and he realizes he didn't get it probated, mm. which means he's not on the title to the property. And so even if he wanted to sell it, he couldn't. It had reached a point in the Why process. is he in foreclosure? He hadn't paid his property taxes for over three years. But he owned the house free and clear. He inherited the house free and clear. His Got grandma it. bought it when she passed. She left it to him. And he had been paying the property taxes on it for years, but was never really on the books mm. for it. And the county doesn't really care if the taxes are coming in, um, if you're the title donor, until a certain point when they haven't got it. They haven't got their back taxes, then... It becomes a problem. Yeah. Like, at that point, it, it can only be redeemed by the titled owner. And so the reason he told me it's hopeless is he had just been to the county treasurer's office with that other wholesaler who said, let me catch you up on your back taxes and buy the house from you. And the county treasurer said, his name is not on this title. He can't even sell it if he wants to. So he thought he had given up. You know, I can't even sell this if I want to. I can't pay these back taxes. Like, So this wholesaler was back at the house giving... William an update and the only way he could give him an update was actually go to his house physically. Exactly. So I imagine yeah. this entire ordeal, every time you're working with William, you're having to go physically to this dude's house. Having to drive there. Yeah. Cause he had no phone, no email, no nothing. Good. So Good. it was about a 20 minute drive from Meridian to Boise. Every time I needed to have any correspondence with him, eventually built a relationship with his neighbor who had a cell phone mm. and could relay information. Oh my gosh, bro. <laughs> Oh, okay. If somebody, it, we already know the punchline is you made a hundred thousand dollars on this deal, <laughs> but obviously how you got there, sure. I don't even think we've started the challenges at all. Really not. So where did the challenges start coming up? Well, I wanted him to be able to still live there. And, and so this initially I thought could be a seller finance opportunity. So we're talking about what he needs to get from the deal. I got his highest offer he had received from another wholesaler, which was 200,000, which was about right for, for what it could sell on the retail market. And I told him I would match that offer, but the problem is you can't sell it to me even if you wanted to. Right. So we have to go a step back and we have to prove you're the heir to this property. And that re requires finding a probate attorney. And I posed the question out in sub two, got a few different ideas on how to go about it. And my wife um, reached out to several different probate attorneys, um, like seven of them, before we finally found one that would say yes. It, in this amount of time, about three days wow. before the auction. And so I. You know how many other people would have, if they got a no, no, I'm not interested, you call two. You know how many people would have just stopped calling probate attorneys? 99% yeah. of people. Right. Well, she called through seven of them. And so that's credit to her. And she was persistent in that because we had something. Because he basically said, look, if you can stop the sale, I will sell you the house. And so now I had to figure out how can I possibly stop the sale. The only way was we needed to get his name on the title yeah. so, his, so he could even have the right to sell it to me. So we were brainstorming with attorneys, what can we even do here? I end up finding out that that will with his name on it doesn't mean anything essentially because after three years it becomes invalid and the the route we had to go is proving he was just the rightful heir to the property as the only living family member so how do you do that now it becomes documentation gathering time and in this three is, days in three days and this is a guy who has a driver's license from 2001 nice. as his one source of id i love it expired um What's this guy doing all day? Do you ever just wonder, like, what are you just sitting in the house, staring he out the window? He just watches TV all day, like 12 hours a day. Wow. Just watches TV all day. And he has, you know, he had some health issues. He had arthritis. He stopped opening the mail. He just wasn't feeling good about himself. Mm. No family, just living by himself. Yeah, I've had a lot of those sellers. Yeah, so he just needed help. He needed all the help. Um, and he didn't help himself at all. <laughs> and so it was like... At some point, it felt like I wanted it more than he wanted it for mm. himself because he was kind of reserved to almost just, I was like, what were you going to do? He's going to let it go. Nowhere to go. Yeah, he had nowhere to go. I mean. Homeless. No, he would have been homeless. Yeah. Like 74 years old with arthritis and no money. So 
I, I bring to the attorney, look, I have this will. He's the only one named on it. You know, he should have, he should, he's the rightful heir to this property. That's, that was the bottom line for me that made me want to push was like his grandma's last wishes were for him to inherit this home. He's lived there over 40 years. It should be his house. Okay. Now he had an oversight and not doing the paperwork correctly. And he was really regretful about that. He was kind of embarrassed that I never got this probated. So I said, you know, maybe there's a way we can patch it up. You know, so this attorney says we can file this affidavit of airship with the court and we'll see if they'll stop the auction. So that's, that was the route we, we went. I gathered as much as I could. Essentially the, the attorney had to sue the county mm. to, to put an injunction and stop the auction. And they had to review the merits of everything we could draft up based on the limited documents that we had. And we had a limited time to do it. So when we served up all those papers, we were kind of patiently waiting to find out, okay, is the judge going to rule in our favor that not even in our favor, just will they put a stop to the auction so we can plead our case. And that takes us up to the day before the auction. Um, so, so with this part, um, this was right around the July 4th holiday. We had, uh, it was, the auction was set to start, start July 5th. Mm. Yeah. So the second was a Sunday. The third was a Monday. Of course. And so the third is basically the last day we have to stop this thing. And yeah. right, cause the fourth is a court holiday or they recognize it. And then the auction set to start on the fifth at eight in the morning. Mm. And and like I said, once it starts, it can't, it doesn't stop. The good That's thing about says, you, Idaho is nobody's hung over in Idaho that won't show up for July 5th. I can't speak for the whole state, okay. but that's probably okay. partially true. It's partially true. <laughs> so, uh, so we get a call from the, um, from the attorney at three o'clock that Monday saying the judge has agreed to sign the order to stop the auction. If you can post $20,000 cash bond by the end of the day. That's in two hours. That's in two hours. Okay. Clock's ticking right away. So, I mean, I don't even wait. I, I'm to my bank. Okay. And to your point with all these things shutting down, my credit union is closed on July 3rd. Of course. I come they to are. find out. Yeah. So I, That's an Idaho holiday. Bro. <laughs> so I say, okay, let me, let me transfer 20 K over to another account and, and withdraw it that way. They put a 10 K limit. Oh, on how much I could transfer. <laughs> So now I'm scrambling, right? It's like 3.15 and, and I'm like, I, I can. It's like you, you want to count up all the points where he should have just quit. <laughs> I think I'm, we're at a dozen right now. <laughs> well, then the attorney needed me to put up a retainer fee of 1500 bucks mm. just to give us a shot. And, yeah. and I just felt it was worth the gamble because we had a case. Um, and so, so, now, so I call, I'm thinking, who can I call? Because I need 20 grand now. And... I call a good friend up there. He's a mortgage broker. We've done deals in the past and have a good relationship. His name's Bryce Gonser. Shout out Bryce. Bryce came through in the clutch for me. Like I was like, man, I'll, I'll give you a thousand bucks if I can just, if you can cut me a check right now, I'll pay you on Wednesday when my bank opens up. So no JV agreement, no paperwork, wouldn't advise it in the Gator community. Don't do that guys. No. <laughs> but when, when Jordan's you know over here someone, breaking rules, all right? <laughs> This was um, a buzzer beater situation. Yeah, so we, we didn't have time to drop paperwork. So he went on my word though, you know? And so I think that might be another nugget from the story is if you have people that trust you and you've yeah. done deals with, um, your word means something. Yeah. So he said, yeah, man, I got you. I said, I don't even have time to tell you all about this deal, but um, you could be a part of something really cool right now. Yeah. And, um, and so he's like, I got you. So he goes to his bank, gets me a cashier's check for 20 grand. I meet him there, pick up the check. I headed to the courthouse. It's 415 by the mm. time I get there. And the court clerk says, the judge went home for the day. We're not going to take your check. Classic. So my response is, that, look, the judge re reviewed the merits of the case. They said, this is, this is you know, it's solid. If we post the money here by the end of the day, she said, I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you. He's gone for the day. I said, is there anyone else I can talk to? Is there another judge? Anybody? I have the money right here. I have what you asked for. 
She said, there's only one other judge right now and he's in session. And I said, well, I'll wait till five o'clock if I need to, to talk to somebody. But I could tell she wasn't that interested in helping me mm. or really cared at that she point. She was already thinking point, about 4th of July. Yeah. <laughs> she, want, she wanted <laughs> sure. to go home. Yeah. And the, the county has a vested interest in the property at this point too. So I'm sitting there, I'm just watching the clock tick and it's like 425. And I'm like, I got to do something. So I'm like, I'm going to go find that judge that's still here. And if I need to bust into the courtroom and interrupt proceedings, that's like, right, I'm going to find a way to be like, this is an emergency. I need to get this signed. And so I tried to get in. This one door was locked. This other guy's like, what are you doing, dude? Like, you can't go in there. Can I help you? Yeah, it's the same thing. It's the same guy on the street. <laughs> he works at the court too. Yeah. It was the exact same tone. Yeah. Um, but he actually could help me. And he pointed me to a lady who I explained the urgency of, a, of the situation. It's like 435 now. And I said, this, this old man is going to be homeless if we don't get this thing signed. I have everything we need. Can you help me? So she's like, okay, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to do something for you. So she goes, she goes and looks in another courtroom. She happens to find the very judge who was still there. This he was had what, not gone home. This for is time. what I was waiting for. This was my favorite part of the whole story. <laughs> yeah is how many times will people lie to you because they're just lazy? Maybe lied, maybe ignorance. I don't know. But, but it was bad but, information but either way. But again, this is the kind of stuff you hear with people in, sorry, real estate agents. Yeah. You'll hear real estate agents like, oh, that's illegal. That's not possible. That's not this. It's, it's lack of education yeah. and lack of interest of actually finding the real answer. She could have easily, right? This girl, mm -hmm. not that she's a bad person, She's just a person. County clerk. And these are things yeah. persons do. These are person things. He's gone for the day. Yep. She did not know that. She made that up. If he had gone Very home for the that. day, then she would have known that. He had not gone home for the no. day. So it's not, she just made it up. Yeah. And instead of you going, oh, darn, shucks, I'm leaving. Yeah. You're opening up doors you should not be opening up. And you're yeah. barreling through like a bull. Yeah. And then finally you end up finding the actual yeah. judge. It's like you got to talk to the right person. And yeah. And you don't necessarily need to trust everybody along the way. Right. Um, and there's usually another way to figure things out. And that proved to be the case. So this is like 4.50. You know, we have 10 minutes to get this. She brings the paperwork in. She gets the judge to sign the order. She goes, hustle up downstairs, get that money on deposit. Wow. And, and so I go back down to that same clerk. I said, look, the judge signed it. Um, she's like, I could tell she was a little perturbed. I had gone around her. Of course. And, and, uh, cause she cares more about her ego than she does about a man that's going to be homeless. And I'm not criticizing the girl. I'm just remind. Yeah. I want to, I want the audience to know that this is going to be stuff that you'll run into in this business. Right. I'm sure you ran into this being an agent for yeah. the four, four prior deals, years. Yeah. Escrow officers will do this. Loan officers will do this. Other agents will lie to you. I'm sure there's been deals where you've done on traditional real estate transactions mm -hmm. where like that agent's obviously lying and they're blowing the deal up and you go and figure it out. Like you are a get it done kind of dude yeah. and you're going to run into those, those people that are like, I don't have the answer, but I'm going to give you the incorrect answer. And most people will go, oh, darn, I don't want to upset her and go around her. So I'm going to let this person go be homeless. You're like, no, dude. I don't care about your feelings. I don't care what's going on. Yeah. We got to get this solved. You know, and at the very least, I at least wanted to go down swinging. Yes. And exhaust my resources, even if that- Put that on could, a t-shirt. Yeah. Which part? What was the go first? Down go down swinging. Yeah. Oh, that's um, so good. You know, and it's a basketball mindset. Shoot your shot. Yeah. You know, same thing. Like, even if you miss it, you want to at least know you gave it a shot you, and you put your best effort out there. You can live with that. You know, I coach my players up on that too. It's like you can, it's, it's a Kanye lyric too. It's like, he can live with, uh, he'd rather, um, given up's way hard, harder than trying. Yes. Given so. up is way harder than trying. Dude, dude don't him, make yeah. me get all Kanye. On <laughs> yeah. Ooh. But it's like, you get what I'm saying. Like you'd rather know you, you did your, you at least tried, even if you lose, even if you fail, um, you at least tried everything you could to get it done. You can go to sleep at night knowing yeah. that. And so this this was no different. And and so, yeah, we get the money deposited. She's kind of reluctant to take the check. Oh. You know, like, okay, I guess we'll take it. So 
So she takes it, and that amount of the 20K was roughly what was owed in the back in the property taxes. Okay. You know, so I'm coming out of pocket for that and figuring this is, you know, it's almost like an earnest money deposit. Like this is my chance to save this deal. But day ends at five o'clock. Okay. There's still a process. We after that is all on file with the court, they still need to sue and basically try to stop it. We didn't have time for all that. So it's kind of in limbo for the whole next day. The next day is a holiday, July 4th. And then the auction starts first thing on the 5th. And so I had to go back to Will and say, look, I, I don't, I think we might've done it, but we're in limbo right now because we don't have an answer yet. Cause like I said, the website says once that auction starts it, there's no stopping it once it starts. So it goes to auction, it goes live. That Wednesday morning, we're kind of just waiting it out. I get a call about 11 that morning, and the attorney says, I can't believe it, but the county's stopping the auction. Yes. He said, you stop the sale. Yes. And it was like, a, it was a... Yeah, baby. <laughs> um, it, was a, it was a great moment, but it also was kind of like, okay, now the work really begins too. Right. Because now we have to build our case. Now a judge has to rule in his favor. Now we have to get his name on the title if they do. And then we need to work out the paperwork. And then I need to find a buyer. So it's really just now we can play. And stopping the sale, basically our agreement on paper, which I'm just writing in a notebook in his living room and taking to an attorney, was um, if, if we stop this sale, he'll sell it to me for 200 k minus the property taxes and minus whatever the attorney fees end up being. That was the deal we worked out. Hmm. So I'll match your highest wholesale offer. I didn't say wholesale, but that was the highest offer he had. But he needed help just to get the property in his name right. to be able to sell it. So um, where do we go from there? We stopped the sale. Um, now it became, now we're, we have to build a case that he is the rightful heir to this property. Like I said, his idea was from 2001. So a notary isn't going to let that fly. So I go to his neighbor's house who has to vouch that, yes, he is who he says he is. And that's how we go through the whole process of everything get, being notarized. The attorney saying, hey, I, I need this, I need that. What proof can you gather? We found a neighbor that had lived there for over 40 years who vouched that he knew his grandma. How many people would be willing to go find that neighbor? <laughs> This was a few doors down and, and he said, oh yeah, I remember, you know, I didn't really have much of a relationship, but he vouched that she lived there with him. And that was a big, that helped our case a lot. Wow. Um, you know, and he signed to that. So, so we were building the case and, you know, he has, the attorney basically was like, I'm going to try to put this guy's life story together to build a case to the judge that this is, you know, who he says he is. And he's always worked off the books just he was a horse trainer and but he didn't have any w no income to show no employment right. history he's a ghost pretty much yeah no social security card he had it he had a number but it was like on a horse trainer card nice like and he hasn't done that for decades so we're we're scrambling um but gathered apparently enough info now now, the county wasn't really going to fight us on it because they didn't have a leg to stand on, proving that he wasn't who he said he was. He was. His, his info was just scattered everywhere. Essentially, if they could get their property taxes, then that's all they're owed. So they were going to have that on deposit. So worst case, even if we can't prove it's him, they take their money and move on. Um, so, yeah, we build our case. Um, we have a zoom call with the judge and the attorney is over 80 years old. No disrespect to anybody over that age, but he couldn't get, But y'all don't know how to do zoom. He couldn't get on the zoom. Okay. Y'all, you can't, you're not even <laughs> watching this cause you can't even turn on your computer. Yeah. yeah. Now Will doesn't have a cell phone or an email address. So this is like doing real estate in 1914, dude. Like, <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're missing our court hearing because they can't connect to the Zoom call. So the judge is calling us like, hey, are you, are you guys going to show up to this thing? It's like, we're all here. We're just trying to figure out the Zoom. And so she's like, Jordan, can you come over? And I just wanted to sit in and be there for it. And so I had to help him connect to the Zoom. And she reviews everything and, um, 
and says, you know, I'm I'm ruling that William should be on the title to the yes. house. Yes. So that was that was another big win, and now he had the right to sell it to me. So now we're starting to add up some numbers. Those attorney fees accrued. Up. Um, I'm finding every little email and call. There's there's a bill, and uh, mm. I think it's I don't know. Welcome two, to working with the hour. attorneys. Yeah, I was like, I'm pretty sure we just talked about it on the phone. Do you really need to email me that question? Oh, of course they do. Yeah, <laughs> like, and my wife is going, you know, they're billing you every time you respond to that, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, well, I kind of have to reply. He's building the case for us. So, but you had to do it that way. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, attorney fees ended up being about sixteen thousand. That's not bad, actually. I to mean, be, he, to he be did fair. a lot of work. Yeah. Um, we found Especially some, since you called six others and they weren't willing to help. This dude deserves his 16000 bucks. Yeah, he earned it. And Shout out to that 80-year-old dude. Yeah, appreciate you. Conrad Aiken. Conrad, bro. Appreciate you. Um, we had a discrepancy in a lot of this back and forth emails. The name on the title was different than the name on the will. And it was a Chinese name translation. And I'm learning all these derelict stuff. And, and he's like... Oh no, it's the same. It's the same name. It's just that's how they write it in Chinese, and it's but but it's written differently on the. It's like there's a G on the end of this word. There's not on this, but it sounds the same. And he was telling me how it's just all about how it sounds. But with all the legal aspects, if that name on the title is of different course. than the name on the will, they need to be able to explain all that. And so. We had Will come in and give a whole explanation on it, and uh, he he sorted it out um, as best he could. But there's just a lot of paperwork to cover, of course, um, to prove to prove his case. So now William's going to stay in the house. So you, you got the you got the deal. You right. backed out the costs. So he you bought it for two hundred. Yeah, there's tw- sixteen thousand in that. All these other expenses. He are, he also has to pay back the taxes. Right. What did he what did he end up getting out of that 200,000? 166. 166. Yeah. This dude and went so, from like yeah, negative. Negative to 166 yeah. grand. You Holy know, on a house no. he never bought, he just inherited it and That's baller. And uh, you know, he said You just you saved the guys from the homeless from homelessness and gave him 166 grand. I mean, he said this will help me through at least the next 10 years of my life if I'm lucky enough to live that long. Wow. And and he's 74. You know, so, you know, the, the next challenge became, where are you going now? Because yeah. initially I wanted him to be able to, to stay there. And then I kind of thought, maybe that's not a good idea because now I'm relying on him for payments. Not the smartest approach. No. I just wanted to help. He wanted to stay there and I wanted to find a way, even if the payments were really low, how can we make this work? So we, we came on seller finance terms initially, and then the next day I went there, he said, you know what, I think I'd rather just have all the cash for it. Yeah. And I said, okay, we'll figure that out too. Now to audience members too, I didn't have 200K in my pocket. This is an important point to get. I offered it because I knew the value of the property. Right. And I knew what somebody would pay for it. Yeah. But someone, someone think, oh, I can't go into somebody's house and offer $200,000. I don't have that. Well, What's the property worth? What can it be worth? Is and that's something you touch on a lot. Is like it's the value is in what you can do with it. Right. And so, can you see through that lens when you're approaching deals? So what'd you do with it? So uh, I sold it to. uh, I initially was in between. Do I fix and flip this myself or do I wholesale it? Now I had never done a fix and flip, but I thought I might be able to make 150. Mm -hmm if I fix and flipped it, but I haven't done it before. Who knows what you're going to run into? It drags the process out. You'll run into everything. Yeah. That's, you, that's the answer. And you had posted a Especially video. Especially a yeah. 40, 40 year old hoarding situation. Yeah. There's just everything. And he's done no maintenance to the house. Of course. Ever. Um, F that. Yeah. And so, and you had posted a video that was something along the lines, like when I look back at some of these deals, I could have just wholesaled versus I, Maybe I made a little bit more f- fixing and flip, but how many more headaches did I go through to earn yeah. that little much more? Right. It would have just been better to flip the contract and let somebody else make a spread. Yeah. And do the work. Um, so ended up uh, consulting a few people, and I went to your event that you spoke at last 
uh, fall, I think it was Limitless in yeah. Salt Lake City, and networked with a bunch of sub two students. One of the sub two leaders in Boise, Mike Key. Yeah, Mike Key. Shout out Mike Key. Yeah, he uh, posted his buy box, and it was like this house checked every box for like everything he was looking for in a flip. Um, and it, it was exactly what he would want to buy. And it was a great deal. And I told, I was very upfront about how good of a, where I had it contracted because I don't think we touched on the comps on this property, which right across the street, two doors down, exact same floor plan, but fully updated, remodeled, had just sold for 425. Yeah, baby. Like two months earlier. So it was a great comp. It was like, this is what that could be. Exact same specs and everything. And then there was another one that was very similar that, that had sold at 409 about six weeks prior. So pretty, you know, we have a pretty good idea of, of that ARV. And so getting it contracted at 200, um, I, I told Mike, if, if you want this at 295, um, and then maybe you let me list it once you fix it all up. So I'm, I, end, I might end up making a little bit more when this is all yeah, said and done. He's, he's been working on it and it's getting pretty close to going on market. Wow. So he um, bought it for two ninety five. He bought it for two ninety five. So you made ninety five, right about there. Um, right about there. Ninety five thousand dollars, one dollar for yep. every problem you ran into. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, it was. A are lot. you kidding me? How many times would you have given up a- along the way? Like, most people would not have turned right at the stoplight. Yeah. Right. So, well, my yeah. My favorite part of the story is what did you do with the ninety five grand? Yeah. So. I had a few other real estate deals in the pipeline as an agent. And so we were doing okay. My wife was working full time in her W-2. Um, and like we talked about, she was pregnant and and going to be a lot more of a, not that two toddlers aren't a lot, but when you add a newborn to that, a lot yeah. more on her plate. And so that, that uh, infusion of cash, at least uh, with other things I had in the pipeline combined, put us in a position where we felt like, Maybe she could transition from her W-2 income and focus on being a mom and still help me in some capacities with admin stuff because yeah. she's really great with that. Um, and so that's what she's done. And she stepped away from that job, which she is. She was fantastic at, and she had great relationships with the people she worked with. It was tough for her. She'd been there five years, and you have those friendships, and it's just hard to walk away. But for this juncture of life, made the most sense with, with having two young kids and a baby. So think this is how I looked at it, right? It think, opened the door for her to do that. Everybody else, right? You're sitting at that stoplight. You're going to turn left, go help your wife, go help your wife, go help your wife. And you decide to turn right. And that deal turns into a $95,000 assignment, which ultimately helps your wife quit her job. And a lot of men would be like, no, I'm not going to do the thing. I'm going to go home and be a good husband. Yeah. I would argue that you're the greatest husband <laughs> because you went out and did your freaking job. Yeah. And you went out and you earned the money that now here, your wife is hanging out with my wife upstairs right now, swimming in the pool and yeah. doing all the fun things. And she doesn't have to worry about work. She can be full-time mom, which is her highest and best calling. Yeah. And, um, you know, I imagine a lot of women that are going through that transition of going from I'm earning money to now I'm taking care of the household. They feel like they don't bring enough to the table. And you and I had a conversation yesterday yeah. on the golf course where I said, look, women need to understand that it's not them that has to bring something to the table. They are the table and it's our job to bring something to them. Yeah. They are the foundation. They are the stability of the household. They are the most important element inside of a home. And it's our job to bring something back to them and, and, and fill that table up with goods. And, and uh, I imagine your wife is going through that transition, but the fact that you gave her the opportunity to go through that transition mm. because you turned right and you went and knocked on this freaking door and you went through every little obstacle along the way. And there's a dozen other things that you ran into that we haven't talked about. Yeah. You know? yeah, we ended up having to co-sign on a lease for his apartment. Yes. Because he wanted go. something a thousand bucks or less every month in Boise. And then he was picky about like the finishes and stuff. Of course he was. <laughs> so Of course he was. So you had to, I remember this, you had to go co-sign for this dude's house. Apartment. Apartment. He, he said just he said I just want the cash for it. And can you help me find an apartment? But nobody no will give him an apartment. Yeah. No, no income history. Yeah. He has a horse nothing. training ID. Exactly. From like 1997. Yeah. And you, so you co-signed for the guy. How are you, how are those yeah. payments being made? Well, out of what he earned on the, you know, he, he earned a pretty good chunk on the deal. 
Yeah, but um, isn't but there some weird situation going on where he has to like pay you or you're you're hold, holding the money back or something weird? Well, we were paying, so we paid the you know security deposit first month's rent, and then we got him all set up online mm. with having automatic payments coming in. Got right it now. Um, but you know, we had to help, we were setting up, my wife's over there setting up his direct TV. He, he had no clue. You know, he, he is, he was, you just, guys changed this guy's life. Yeah. He, he was, he come, he complained a lot through the process, but was really grateful at the end. Mm. But I think just like that state, you know, just maybe unhappy with your life in general at that of point. Course. But yeah, I mean, we extended an olive branch and he took us up on it. Um, and I don't think there's I don't a moment know that. in the life this guy's turned down help. I mean, this that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and and now he's, you know, he has a place to live. He has money in the bank. Um his rent is how much a month? 9.95 a month. Wow. Which is about as good as you can do. In Boise? And, yeah. That's a great deal. We paid for the mover, you know, a whole junk removal team. This was this would be another thing I'd say if you're trying to sell a deal to a flipper is I Clean paid to have, it out. Yeah, we cleaned it out. We, and there was a lot to clean out. Um, and then we also, I paid for an inspection report and uh, had a general contractor give a bid on what he estimated the rehab mm. would look like. And so I could kind of present that to Mike yep. or anybody else potentially who might want to buy it and say, look, this is what it is. Here's the comps. Here's the rehab cost. Here's an inspection report. So maybe they have a little more security and like they, you always probably run into a few things you don't expect, but it presented the opportunity for what it was. I love it. Yeah. Well, what's your biggest takeaway from all this? Where there's a will, there's a way. And the seller's name is Will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that was something my grandma taught me a lot actually growing up. She said, where there's a will, there's a way. Like, can you persist and find a way to get it done? Can you figure it out? And so she was really proud of me for this deal. And I got to, you know, from the jump, I went home after I knocked his door and told her all about the situation. And so she was there every step of the way, wow. getting updates on the process. And and his name was yeah. freaking Will. I know, of all, yeah. <laughs> Did you ever say to him, like, hey, Will, don't worry. We're, we're, wherever there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> Did you ever say that to him? I mean, I don't think he's familiar with the expression, but he, I told him I'm going to find a way to get it done for you. Wow. Yeah. Guys, give it up for freaking Jordan. Yeah. That's freaking amazing. I, I love it. It's like you're, you're, you know, three points down, you got five seconds left. You're, you've got to figure out creative ways to, to get, to win the game. And you just can't, you came from behind and freaking made it happen. Yeah. I, I kind of, I feel like it pulls the best out of you when your back's against the wall, at least yeah. for me. Um, and so, yeah, it felt like a buzzer beater situation. And, so good. And uh, I mean, I would call it the most challenging deal I ever did. I've done a lot traditionally where you hit all kinds of roadblocks. This one felt different because of the magnitude of what he was facing if if I didn't come through for him. And I haven't paid that a whole lot of mind, but I really it's like what what if I what if I didn't? Yeah. You know, um he might be living under a freeway overpass or yeah. something. And so so it was extremely challenging, but the most fulfilling. Uh, of any deal I've ever done. And you changed as a person, I think as well. You also have evidence that this business is pretty magnificent. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could do a couple of deals like that a year, yeah. you know, and a couple hundred in, in Boise, those kind of, kind of deals, not saying like Williams specific type of structure is around every single place, but these hundred thousand dollar deals are everywhere in Boise. It's a big, it's a market that it's a phenomenal market. It's growing. It's, it's expanding. People are flipping. People are doing a lot of deals. It's amazing that you can like see your wife working at her job as an executive assistant. I look at that now of like whatever I want in my life, I go, okay, my wife, I don't know what your wife was making, but let's say it's 50 grand. I go, that, that's one deal. Yeah. Like you're one deal away from your wife quitting. Yeah. Right? You're one deal away from solving this other problem. We're just one deal away. It's so freaking great, dude. Congratulations. Well, thank you. It, it's the power of one more, right? Yeah. We talked about this. You're going yes. on Ed Milet's podcast. Yeah, you're coming month. with me. Yeah. I don't know when it is, but sometime in the next month or two. Yeah. Um, and, and when I first got plugged in with sub two, I heard you speak at that circle event with AJ Osborne and Brittany Arneson. And I came home that night and I had followed you on YouTube for a while. So I was familiar with your content, 
but I hadn't seen the value in the community until I started meeting other sub two members Yeah, and them just connecting people. And you point me to Julie Burkhart and Wes Grant and all these people who are at your meetup. And it's like, everyone is helping everyone. And it felt so different than like, I go to a conference and it's all real estate agents and it's no disrespect. They're trying to level up their knowledge. I mean a lot of disrespect to you agents. Okay. (laughs) It's a different feel. You know, it's like everyone's trying to out for themselves in a way. Like I'm trying to level up my business, which is good. Yeah. But they're not like, how do I help you? Right. How do we collaborate? How do we empower each other? And I think that's one of the cool thing about our community is that there's so many different avatars that we've created and identified, like even the helper, we were talking about this on the golf course yesterday. You're like, that was one of the avatars I was sleeping on until I had a little higher level understanding. And now I look back at that avatar and go, Oh my gosh, that, that probably is me. Yeah. And like who would have, who identifies this stuff? Most people are like, Oh, you're a cold caller and you're doing wholesale deals. Here's your lane. Yeah. Whereas in our community, there's so many different, people and ways that you can make money and do deals with each other that 10, 15, 20 people can make all make money on the same exact transaction. Yeah. And that's kind of the next direction I want to go is, is teaching others, coaching others. We have a wholesale team we're building in Boise and just teaching others how to find deals and get it done. And when you do one like this, you know, you talk about the benefits of buying real estate, the six things and all those, but one of the, the one that slept on is the story. Yeah. At the end, I always forget that one when you're like, "Okay, what are the six reasons you buy real yeah, estate?" Yeah, yeah. I'm like story. Oh yeah, story. But when you do something like that and you get through it, it's like, man, I did that. Yeah. Now it, it kind of propels your confidence. And in also, life. the other thing about the story is like, here you are on the podcast. People are going to reach out to you. The story of this deal will yeah. compel people to reach out to you and do yeah. more deals with you. I tell people. Telling the story of my deals makes me more money than the deal I did Yeah. because more people reach out to me, give me money, opportunity, they can work for me or whatever else. So the story is an amazing story. How, but how can people reach out to you? I'm Instagram at Jordan Wittenberg. Um, and I have a YouTube channel going at Jordan Wittenberg. Love it. So just my name branded and, um, I'm a realtor in Boise, but you're the realtor in <laughs> Boise. Mean, I, it's, okay. It's something I do, but he's I'm, the number one realtor in Boise. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you, um, I'm focused more on the investor side. And so if someone wants to do a deal traditionally, there's better ways to do it. I can help you with that, but I like doing creative stuff cool. and, I, and I like looking at it through an investor lens, uh, more than anything. Uh, so I, I like to consider myself like an investor, uh, uh, an agent that has the investment in mind. And, and finding deals like that more than anything. Love it. Yeah. Guys, give it up for yeah. Jordan. Thank you, guys. Boom. Thank you, dog. That was great. Thanks for having me. Phenomenal. Yeah.